We know, my God, that you made a way for man and you will continually make a way for man. Lord, we know when unrighteousness rules in a house or in a nation, we know that the, 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 the whole nation falls. And Lord, we're asking you today that you'll help us as a people to, to, to stand for righteousness. And, and Lord, we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory for that. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. We're living in, I believe, in some of the most stupid times. It has to be in the humanity of the time of humanity. Where we're seeing uh, things being shaken. There's so much uncertainty. Where there's so much how we can have people that would say that it's okay to abort a baby uh, one day before it's due to be born. And that that baby is nothing. Uh, Nancy was talking and she started to weep as she, as she read the article or she heard the article about uh, a woman that worked in an abortion clinic. She'd heard the propaganda, she'd heard all, the, all what everybody says that the baby in the womb and all that, the fetus does not feel any pain and blah, blah, blah. And she was working in the, in the front office as a secretary, but apparently there must be some rules that you have to have a certain amount of people in the theatre when these abortions are being carried out and people that were supposed to be there came in sick. And so they asked her if, they, if she would come into the abortion clinic while this abortion was being uh, performed. And she said she walked in there and as she was there and as they were going through the procedures, as they were tearing this little baby apart, she said she literally heard the cries of the child. She heard the cries and the screams of this defenseless, defenseless little baby. And she walked, she ran out of that place and she left that place and now she stands and she stands for her life in Jesus' name. Amen. But we're, there's so many different things that, that football players can go out there and, and rape and abuse and, and uh, their, their girlfriends and uh, drunken binges and goodness knows what else and they get a slap on the wrist. But a man stands up and quotes the Bible and he gets it sacked. I'm talking about our nation has gone crazy. There are people that are making rules and decisions that there are unrighteous rules. There are unrighteous decisions. They're not right. And somehow or other, I believe that our nation, Australia, the great south land of the Holy Spirit, needs to have a people, the voice of God, that we would stand up as a voice and be, and be spoken about and, and stand up with Israel for Ireland, stand up with people and with, even with politicians that stand up for righteousness, that want to see right things, things turn around. I believe that you and I all have a choice. We've got a choice how we build. And we see today that even the church, is, as we're going uh, towards what I, I don't know, the church has been uh, uh, drifting away. I don't know what's happening in the church today. But I believe that we as people have got a choice whether we build our lives upon the sand or whether we build our lives upon the rock Christ Jesus. We can build our lives on the world system and when this shake comes uh, about, we will fall. We will, we will not have anything to stand on, but if, if we build our Christian lives on the rock Christ Jesus, when the shaking comes, we will stand. There was a great ship that was built. It was called the Titanic. How many people have ever heard about the Titanic? It was, a, it was, a, it was a, the ship of all ships. It, it was... They say unsinkable. It was the most beautiful and everything about it. It was so awesome. And on that maiden voyage, everybody got on board and their expectation and everything like that. But how many people know that the Titanic sank? How many people know why the Titanic sank? Yes, sir. A comment was made. That's a pretty bad comment to make. Anybody else know why it was sunk? Yes, ma'am. It hit an iceberg. Anybody else know why it sunk? Yes. Too many people? No, that was okay. I think they had enough, right? Yes. Metal? They said that was metal was inferior. All those things. I want to tell you why the Titanic really sunk. It filled with water.
It filled with water. Very, very simple. You see, if the water gets into the ship, if the world gets into the ship, something that's meant to sail on the water and be very, very comfortable and very, very good, but if the water gets into that ship, it will sink. And if the world gets into the church, we will sink because we'll build our lives upon the sand. And, and I, I believe that, that God wants to change some things. Amen. I want to be strong and have a foundation to stand on. You've got to remember that not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. We've got to understand and know the mysteries of God. I believe the two very, very powerful words is understanding and knowing. How many people want to know? How many people really want to understand the things of God? So is it, I don't, I don't want to have some sort of a sloppy gospel. I don't want to have like just that everybody's just going to make it. I don't want to have just that God so loved the world, how could God ever refuse me? When he says not everybody that even says Lord, Lord is going to enter the kingdom. And I believe that we've got to be wise master builders as we build our own life. I like what, what uh, Kevin said there today, that when they came with their lamb, that the person didn't look at them, he looked at the lamb. And I praise God today that I can stand before you today and that I know that God doesn't look at me, he looks through the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses me and makes me right before God. And if I don't come and if I don't, and if I don't open myself to God and allow His presence to come over me and through me and touch me, where will we be? I believe that it's, a, it's very, very interesting. I've got my phone at the back desk there. I don't know much about my phone. I take it to an IT person. Bingo. He fixes it. <laughs> What are my most famous words? How did you do that? <laughs> How did that happen? How did you do that? The phone has got many functions that I don't use because I don't understand it. And we've got to come to an understanding of this book and what God has made available to us. What God has done. He opened the sea, not just to display his power, not just to show what he could do or, or so that he would be, have accolades or anything like that, but he opened, it, opened that sea so I could walk right through it. He opens a way so you and I can escape, escape the attack that's happening to humanity today. Christians are being attacked. People are being attacked. In John 20, verse 30, it says this, And, tr and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Jesus just is not limited to, he did many other signs and things like that that are not, were not written. It says here in John 21, 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they had, had sorry, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's an amazing statement. Things that we are not aware of, that God did it. Father, I ask you today that you would open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, that you would, the revealer of truth. Holy Spirit, the Bible says that when you come, you will reveal the Christ. You will not speak of yourself, but you will speak of him, the one who paid the price. And I pray today, my God, that we would get a fresh revelation 
and a fresh understanding that we might know, my God, that you have come and you have destroyed and you have defeated the enemy and you've made a way for us to escape. And my God, I pray that we would live in victory, not in defeat. I'm not a, I, I'm not a slave to the enemy. I am a child of God. And you have abolished that, that caused that thing to, to stop me and destroy me. You've broken it. And I've been able to walk right through it and into the fullness of you, my God. And we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory for that. And everybody said, Amen. You see, I make no excuses today that I repeatedly quote the Scripture that I'm going to read to you in Ephesians. If you don't know and understand the work of the Holy Spirit, we will be limited. We will be limited like I am with my phone. I am limited because of my knowledge. But I want to tell you this. There's some five-year-old children that know more about the phone, my phone, than I do. We are living in a time, I believe, when the church has been shaken and challenged. And I believe that God will have His way. Do you believe that? So I want you to open up your Bibles this morning to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, which I believe are some of the most important scriptures for you and I as we read these scriptures. It says here in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. How many people would like that? Come on, lift up your hands this morning. Why don't you ask God? God, open my eyes. Come on, you have not because you ask not. Lift up your hands. This is not a trick question. You're not giving away $1,000. <laughs> Just lift up your hands. Say, God, will you open the eyes of my understanding? Will you open it? Will you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you? Amen. Ask Him, ask Him. The eyes of your understanding or the eyes of your heart being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. Far above. Where are we seated? Far above. In heavenly places, far above. All principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he had put all things under his feet and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. You believe that today? You see, I believe that Jesus wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever imagine or think. When we know and understand these truths, we will have the dominion that God intended the church to have. It says in the book of Genesis that I will give them dominion over the cattle, over the fish, over the birds of the air, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In other words, they lived in a place of victory. They lived above and not beneath. They lived, friend, God wants every one of us not to be, be hassled and not to be smashed, but He wants us to live in victory. He wants us to overcome. He wants us to triumph. He wants to give us dominion and authority. You see, Jesus walked on earth as a man. Is that correct? But he used this dominion. He used this authority. And I want to quote some things for you today that we can sort of get a hold of. The weak Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus turned water into wine. The weaker, the weaker must give place to the greater. And if you can understand this principle, Jesus just didn't do things because He had nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon. 
Jesus did everything because he wanted us to understand the authority and the power that God wants to invest in every one of us. The weaker must yield to the stronger or to the higher. The weaker will always yield. And if we can understand that, if we can catch a glimpse that Satan is already defeated and that God has given us the victory, instead of coming under the enemy, we will know that the enemy, the weaker, will have to yield to the stronger Jesus Christ. If I come in my own strength, he won't yield. But I've come in the strength of Jesus. In the animal world, we see there that they've got alpha males and alpha, and those people, they rule and reign. The lesser has to yield to the greater. The Bible says this about you and me. It says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So the greater will manifest over the weaker. The weaker the world principles must yield to the greater principle. You see, God, God when we worship and, and live by God, we live by principles. We live by a, a standard. We don't go to a shop and get put in $10 and, and get change of 100 and walk out saying, praise the Lord, God bless me today. Oh, is that what we do? Amen. Oh, I let that one settle for a while. It's caught me by a bit by, by, by a storm. The weaker has to yield to the stronger. Unbelief has to yield to faith. You believe that today? Okay, let's, let's have a quick look at Romans chapter 4. We all know these things, and I make no excuse for repeating them. I make no excuse for bringing them back to our attention. In, 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 in 17 of, of chapter 4, it says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, when, when we come to a situation, we are not moved by what we know in the natural we are moved by what we know in the realm of the Spirit. Greater is He that's in me than He that's within the world. So I've got to, even though I may at this moment be living in failure and defeat, I've started to apply that principle to my life and I begin to call things that be not as though they were. And when I start doing that, I'm coming into agreement with what God says about me. I'm saying that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I start to speak the Word of God, and I start to call those things that be not as though they were. The Word of God says this, Let the weak say they are strong. Let the poor say they are rich. So, you know, if, if you're saying that, well, that sounds stupid, you're poor. No, no, I'm bringing in a principle. I'm bringing in something that's going to break the stronghold, break the mold, break the cocoon, that's going to open up the Red Sea so I can walk right through it. So I can walk into my destiny, so I can walk into my purpose. Friend, the church has got a purpose and a plan on this earth. It is not a bless me club. It is a place of war. It is a place there where we believe God and we see great things. It says there who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. So that he became, so shall your descendants be. And listen to this, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And here is a man whose body is dead 
is a woman whose womb is dead. The weaker had to yield to the stronger, and the stronger said, you are going to have a child. And I want to tell you, if you start to call things that be not as though they were, you're going to smash the stronghold. You will smash the cocoon. You will smash the obstacles that are around your life, and you'll walk into your destiny and into your purpose. The weaker has to yield to the stronger. Did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred year old, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God, but he was convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Amen. That's where faith comes in. That's where speaking comes in. That's where our lives can change. Knowing that the weaker must yield to the stronger. And it will in Jesus' name. Do you believe that? Death has to yield to life. Sickness has to yield to healing. Ephesians 3.16. Let's go back to there. that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to understand or comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church. Amen. How about we give Him a round of applause for that? Amen. Why don't we give Him a bit of thanks for that in Jesus' name? What an amazing God we serve. It's God in us, the hope of glory. It's God in us, the hope of glory. Jesus said, these things that I do, you can do also. He didn't say, these things that I did, you shall do also. He said, these things that I do. I want to tell you today, Jesus is still doing it, but He wants to do it through us. He wants to do it through you. But if we're so full and so crowded and so, so negativity or whatever else gets around us, nothing much will happen. Nothing will change. Amazing. I'm talking today about weakness yielding to strength. I want you to have a quick look with me in the book of Mark. I know I'm not supposed to use any more than one scripture, that guy said. Sorry about that, David. <laughs> this is just after Jesus dies. He's on a cross. The disciples are all negative. I'm talking to you truth today, friend, because negativity will get around your life if you allow it. These disciples who are with Jesus all these years, when Jesus departed from them, they got negative. Sometimes when things, bad things start to happen to Christians, we think that God has abandoned us. We think Jesus has left us. That's what they thought. They thought Jesus has abandoned us. When, when bad things start happening, we, we get all hurt and negative and, and that negative thing can get around us. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. We need a move of the Spirit of God that will come and burn inside us again. And here are the disciples. They're, they're there. And it says here in Luke 16, verse 14, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had, who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, You see, we need, we need to hear the voice of Jesus. We need to hear from the pulpit 
The anointed word of God. Amen. Not gossip. Not, not fables. Not things that will tickle people's ears. But I want to tell you, only the power of God, only the anointing of God, only that unadulterated word of God is what's going to penetrate the hearts of men and women. That will cause change to come upon us. And if ever there's a time that the church needs change, it has to be today. It has to be now. It has to be now. And he said to them, and as he spoke to them, I believe he carried the mantle, he carried the anointing. And that anointing was moving and working and touching people's lives. Friend, I want to tell you this, it's no good coming to church if we're just going to sit there, but we've got to allow the anointing inside us. We've got to allow the anointing to touch us. We've got to allow the presence of God to touch us. We've got to allow God to get on the inside of us. We've got to allow change to come to break the hardness of our heart and the unbelief. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents or drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The Bible says, and then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying words, uh, with the accompanying signs rather. Friend, I ought to tell you, here they are in weakness, failure and defeat. And weakness has to give way to strength. Weakness will give way to the anointing, amen. We need the anointing, amen. (laughs) I need the anointing. I don't want to just be, I want to be anointed. The anointing, the anointing, the anointing. The anointing, the anointing, the anointing. Friend, the tide turned that day as weakness yielded to strength. These people who are sitting there with unbelief and hardness of heart, feeling so miserable and goodness knows what, but as the strength came in, that weakness yielded. That it just didn't yield that they, that they got their lives right with God. But the Bible says that they got up and they went out and they, can, they spoke the word. They spoke the word with power and with authority. And that what God said, he accompanied them with signs and wonders and miracles. We need signs and wonders and miracles. We need the power of God again. That day unbelief yielded to the stronger. And they turn the world right side up. Jesus walked on water. The weaker had to yield to the stronger. Peter walked on water. I want you just to have a quick look at this too in Revelation 3.20. I'm, I'm quoting scriptures that I've quoted not once but many, many, many times. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. You believe that today. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me upon my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I believe that Jesus is always knocking. He's knocking on the door of the church. He's knocking on your door. He's knocking on the door of the believer. I stand at the door and I knock. When Jesus comes knocking, let him in. Let him in. Don't just open the door and leave the screen door still locked. He's not trying to sell you something or he's not a Jehovah Witness, although he is. (laughs) Open up the screen door. Open up the doors of your heart. Open up the doors of your life. Another scripture that we quote here many, many times, man. Psalms 24. 
I want to read it so I can get the whole gist of the thing. Because many times when I, I've memorized it out of the, the King James and now I'm with the new King James and I've got the, both of them mixed up and I don't know which one's which anymore. It says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So when he comes knocking on your door, open the door because you see the King of glory wants to come into your life. That can't be a bad thing. That's got to be a good thing. Turn to somebody and say, that's got to be a good thing. <laughs> that could be a good thing, amen. When you open up the door, he said, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open the door, I will come in. Who wants to come in? The King of glory wants to come in. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord strong and mighty in battle. He is the one that wants to open the Red Sea. He's the one that wants to open up every prison door. He's the one that wants to stop you from going through the hassles that you're going through. He's the one there that wants to set you free. He wants to fight for you. Oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Anybody else think that's a good thing? Amen. Stand at the door. Let him in. The king of glory wants to come in. The Lord strong and mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. That's why the Bible says no weapon formed against you can prosper. You in Christ, the stronger one condemns the weaker one. The weaker one must yield. Another Verse of scripture, I'm going to have to use another one. Is that all right, Dave? Anybody getting anything out of this? True, you don't sound like you do. I have to put that applause thing up again and clap here and shout here. Spit there. Run there. It's terrible. I feel so embarrassed. Did I tell you where? John 11, verse 38. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he is, stink, he is, he is stench. For he has been dead four days. He's been dead four days. God calls things that be not as though they were. I don't know about you, but when Jesus came into my life, there was a stench around my life. The stench of death. The stench of sin. The stench. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took the stone away from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Death, the weaker, had to give way to the stronger. Death, the weaker, had to give way to the stronger. I've heard it preached many, many times that if he hadn't used the word Lazarus, if he hadn't have said that word, every dead person that had ever died would have come back to life. I believe that. I believe that, friend. I believe that that is possible. Here is a man, 
A man standing there. Jesus walks up to a, pit, a tomb. A man who had been dead four days. Why didn't Jesus walk up saying, you know, if we see a wheelchair, if we see a blind eye, we go, oh dear me. No, it's because we don't know who we are. We don't know who, who's with us. We don't know who lives inside us. We think we're just mere men or mere women walking around with, a, with perhaps a, a Bible or something like that. No, the greater one dwells within us. But Jesus walked up to that tomb knowing exactly who he was, knowing exactly what he carried, knowing exactly what God could do, knowing the Father, knowing the power of God, knowing, 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 knowing. Friend, we've got to know, we've got to know, we've got to know, we've got to know, we've got to understand. And he spoke those words, and as he spoke those words, this man just stood to his feet, glory to God. He come out there still in grave clothes. But Jesus spoke to death. The weaker had to yield. Death had to yield to life. Because the King of glory spoke to death. He wants to speak through us. Jesus knew who he was. He had no doubt about that. He stood just before verse 25 and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. Do you believe this? You see, every word that Jesus said, and that might have been to a man that was dead, his body was dead, the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he believed what God had promised he was able to perform. Amen. Church, we in this year that we're living in, and I don't know if anybody notices it, but we're already in the fifth month. Where has this year gone? Where has it gone? Amen. Gone with the wind. You will never get that last month back. It's gone. It's gone. I am the resurrection and the life. And I've written in this book of mine, well, I haven't written it yet, but I'm going to write it because I haven't got a page there yet. But Acts... 972 verse 6. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. All things are passed away. I've been born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. And you've got to declare it. You've got to speak it. You've got to, you've got to stand up and you've got to smash some things. God calls things that be not as though they were. In Luke 4, 1, in the wilderness, Jesus was tempted, meaning that he could have yielded to temptation. The devil's an idiot, yes, but he's not that big an idiot. No good me coming up to Greg and saying, I'm going to fight you because I know he's going to beat me. So I won't go there. <laughs> So why would the devil come up and tempt Jesus if he knew that he, was, he could not be tempted? He was tempted in every way that you and I are get tempted. He was tempted. But you see, he didn't yield to temptation. The stronger will always overcome the weaker. He could have yielded, but he used the word of God and the weaker Satan had to we had to weed <laughs> had to yield to Jesus the word. We've got to get the word into us, friend. We need the word of God. Tom said in his Easter message, and I think I'll get this right. Jesus conquered Satan in the wilderness, but he destroyed him at Calvary. Today, whether you know it or not. Satan is the weaker vessel. We, the church, are the stronger vessel. Amen? The weaker vessel must yield to the stronger. Father, I ask you today that as a people, as a people, 
Lord, not so long ago we, we had two great, great celebrations. One of them was the Anzacs. Lord, we see the, some of the movies and some of them are real shots, and real life shots of, of diggers standing to their feet running towards an enemy with machine guns and being mowed down. But as they kept coming relentlessly, as they kept coming, soon they overcame. Soon they drove back what looked like an unwinnable war. Soon they triumphed. And we gave them honor. But Lord, we also celebrated a time that we call Easter. We say to the Anzacs, lest we forget. But Lord, many of us forget the battle that Jesus fought. We forget. We forget the price that he paid. And Lord, we cannot even imagine the pain, the suffering, the shame of a sinless man as he carried all of our weaknesses and all of our pain and all of our shame. All of our guilt, all of it. All of it. We can't even imagine what it would have been like to be in Hades for those three days. We don't know what happened in those three days. But I would imagine that it wasn't a picnic for you, Jesus. We celebrate you, Jesus. You died for us and you want us to live for you. I pray, my God, for this church. I pray, my God, that we will be a voice for you. I pray, my God, that we will open the doors of our life. That we would not look at what the natural mind sees, but we would look into the realm of the Spirit. Knowing that the weaker will yield to the stronger. And Jesus, I pray that you'll lift your church. You'll raise her up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stand to our feet. I believe that sickness will yield. The weaker will yield to the stripes of Jesus Christ. There may be areas in your life this morning that you want to just break through and break free. You want to walk through that sea. You want to walk through whatever it is that, that we need to walk through. I'm just going to open this altar for people if they'd like to come. You need prayer and you've got faith to believe that you can be healed. You believe that you can be healed. Come. And let's join our faith together. Knowing that the weaker must yield to the stronger. I'm a new creation brand new man Father touches this morning let your presence come as we worship as we honor you